This episode of the Elevate Your Leadership podcast is brought to you in part by iFly Virginia Beach Indoor Skydiving. At iFly Virginia Beach, we bring people together through the dream of flight. To learn more about our leadership development and team building, visit iFlyVirginiaBeach.com. Welcome to the Elevate Your Leadership podcast series with U.S. Navy Special Operations veteran, CEO, and hockey fanatic, Bob Pizzini. Bob discusses leadership, success, failure, defining moments, and hard lessons learned with guests who are intentional in their approach to leadership. Leadership is a perishable skill. Use it or lose it. In this series, entrepreneurs, industry executives, academics, public figures, and other highly effective professionals share their formulas for success with you. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of Elevate Your Leadership with me, your host, Bob Pizzini. If you've listened to my previous episodes, which I hope you have, you will know that I love to have discussions with people who not only bring great value to me and my organization, but these are people who I know will bring great value to you and your organization. And today's guest, Jen Kiggins, State Senator Jen Kiggins, has done a lot in her life. And the value that she's going to bring to us through this discussion, I think, is going to be tremendous. I'm going to read Jen's bio briefly. Jen Kiggins is a former Navy helicopter pilot and current geriatric nurse practitioner who was, who was elected to Virginia's 7th Senate District seat in November 2019. This seat includes parts of Norfolk and Virginia Beach. After completing Navy flight school and being winged as a naval aviator in 1995, Jen served for a total of 10 years as a helicopter pilot flying H-46 and H-3 helicopters. I've jumped out of plenty of H-46s. She completed two deployments to the Persian Gulf. After the Navy, Jen went back to school using her GI Bill to become a board-certified adult geriatric primary care nurse practitioner. She is a graduate of Old Dominion University's nursing school and Vanderbilt University's nurse practitioner program. Jen serves as a primary care provider for a small private practice in Virginia Beach and has worked in several long-term care and nursing facilities in Virginia Beach and Norfolk. Senator Kiggins was elected to the Virginia Senate in 2019 and has served three sessions. She has championed legislation to promote election security, establish a military spouse liaison, and advocated for patients, families, and caregivers in long-term facilities. She is a mom to four busy children. Her husband, Steve, is a retired F-18 pilot and current United Airlines pilot. You guys probably talk about like radar altimeters at the dinner table or something. (laughs) Senator Kiggins is now running for Virginia's 2nd Congressional District, which includes Virginia Beach, the Eastern Shore, parts of Chesapeake and Southampton, Isle of Wight, Suffolk, and Franklin County. Jen Kiggins, welcome to the Elevate Your Leadership podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So what what a what a bio, what an interesting um, life you've had thus far. And I want to ask you about certain aspects of that. And I want to start with one of the things that's cool about uh, being in the Navy. You served, uh, I served for 26 years. We meet new people almost every single day. And one of the first things we ask, where are you from? So Jen Kiggins, where are you from? Yeah, yeah. Good good question to start with. I'm from Orlando, Florida, actually. I grew up uh, in the land of Mickey Mouse and Disney World. I actually worked there in high school. That was part of the bio you left off. (laughs) That was one of my first jobs was uh, was working at Disney and uh, in the food service industry down there, which uh, which you really learn a lot about customer service at a place like Disney World. And we all go through Disney College and they're very (laughs) focused on customer service. So so it was a it was a great place to start and great roots. I also worked in the library for a little bit down there. That was a high school job of, of mine. I went to a, this is kind of an interesting story. I went to a Catholic school down there, Catholic high school. And uh, my parents didn't have money to send me to Catholic school, but I really wanted to go to this Catholic high school that my friends were going to. So, so they said, well, you can go, but you have to work and you have to pay your own tuition and uh, you have to give us all of your paychecks. So I got a job at the library and I had also cleaned houses for some of my 
uh, mother, my mom was a nurse. So some of the nurses she worked with had me over on the weekends. So between cleaning houses and working at the library, I gave my dad all of my paychecks and I was able to afford most of my tuition. He would keep a ledger and say, well, this is how much you've paid for wow. your tuition this month. This is how much you still owe me. And I, I keep asking him if he's, I think it got lost a lot <laughs> because there'll be a lot of interest, I'm sure at yeah. this point in paying him back. But it really taught me, you know, a lot about the value of just hard work. And if you want something, you know, if you work hard enough, you can probably get it. <laughs> yeah. And, and but what a unique story, though. I mean, people work hard so you can pay your Catholic tuition. My kids both went to Catholic school at one point and they were like working hard to get out of the school. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a funny story, but uh, but it was a great education and set me up just on a on a on a great path. And, uh, and then I went to school in Boston at Boston University was where I went to college the first time and studied international relations. And I actually went before flight school, you, you know, you started talking about my Navy career, but I went to Japan and taught English with the Japan Exchange and Teaching Program. That was a, I was an exchange student there in high school and really just loved, loved that experience and wanted to go back and teach English at the same school that I had been a student at. So I was able to take a year off for going to flight school with the Navy and went back with the, the JET program, the Ch Japan Exchange Teaching Program and taught uh, English in public schools for a year in Japan, which was which was awesome. That's my second language. That's kind of my second home. Japan. Wow. So it was really so. A, so you're conversational or fluent in Japanese? I can get by. <laughs> okay. I have a friend I have to introduce you to. It's a high, I, I coach hockey and uh, one of our hockey moms uh, was in Japan for, for like three or four years. And she's just everything Japanese. And it's, it's pretty, yeah. do you dream or did you, have you dreamt in Japanese? Way back when, now not anymore, and I obviously don't speak it hardly ever these days, but when I lived there and, and did a lot of English teaching there, and then we went back with the Navy with my husband's Navy job. He was stationed there, and I was uh, had my my kids and was a stay-at-home mom, So, and we lived downtown, so I've lived in Japan probably on and off about five years. And oh, wow. Uh, wow. So yeah, I, there were some points where I, you have dreams in other languages, but yeah, uh, I well, really love to get back there. Exactly. And that's when you know you're starting to learn the language is when you either dream in the language. I lived in Italy for three years, right? So okay, you either yeah. dream in the language or you can actually have a telephone conversation. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so, you're thinking so, about language, yeah. Yeah. All right. So, hey, so super cool. So uh, Orlando, Florida, awesome. You know, the state of Florida. I love what a great what a great place to grow up. We talked about your education a little bit. What drove you to the Navy? Ah, uh, well, my dad was in the army actually. So my dad was an army veteran and he was a Green Beret, Green Beret in Vietnam. So he had served there. And then after Vietnam, he got out of active duty and went reserve. So he, he one week in a month, put his uniform on and, and went and drilled in two weeks a year. And I, I just remember him, you know, when he would come home after his drill weekends and uh, still had his camouflage uniform on and uh, my my parents are both extremely patriotic, uh, but especially my father, who had lost you know many friends in Vietnam, uh, and made it a point of any time we were in Washington D.C., we always visited the Vietnam Wall, and and he just really made a point during you know, things like Memorial Day, Veterans Day, uh, you know Fourth of July, we we really celebrated all of, all of the really every day, but especially on those special days where we honored uh, servicemen and women who serve for our country, uh, just significant holidays. We would go and visit, you know, national cemeteries and, and put flags out. So I was just really raised in a, in a home that really respected the flag, respected the country and those people who had served our country. So I think that made a big impact on me. And I also lived in Orlando where we had a Navy base. Uh, it yeah. used to be where there was an, an enlisted, enlisted who would go to school boot camp. And yeah. so we would have a lot of these sailors over for holidays, like Thanksgiving and Christmas. And we'd go pick them up on base and kind of adopt them for the day and have That's them so cool. uh, over for holidays. So that was, that was kind of fun. So at least I knew that the Navy was out there too. And so then when it was an option to, uh, to apply for ROTC scholarships. That was how I, if I was going to go to college, I was going to have to get a ROTC scholarship, uh, but it was okay. I, I was familiar, you know, enough with it because we had had a lot of sailors in our home. I knew my dad's army career and his army friends. So it was a very familiar way of life for me. And so just, I applied for the, you know, Navy ROTC scholarship and, and because I thought service to country was, was really important. I, I think that that's an important piece. If you want to be a leader in our country, I think having served the country is an important component of that. So, I could not agree um, more. You know, I, I had a discussion with Hong Kao, who is running for the 10th district, who I know yeah. you know, and he gave the numbers and I can't remember off the top of my head, but uh, we currently have the least number of uh, congressmen and women who have served on active duty. Yes. 
Uh, it's a historic low, which is unfortunate. And I really believe, I, I wish that service in some capacity, it could be, you know, Peace Corps, it could be some other form of government service, but uh, maybe you can have that discussion when you get in there and uh, yeah. make some form of government service a requirement to even be eligible to run, you know, what a, yeah. what a difference Definitely that helpful. would make. Very yeah, yeah. So, so Navy, and then how and why helicopters? So I graduated from college after my four years of, of Navy ROTC, which I loved. I, lo- I loved the ROTC program. It was a, it was a great balance. I was in a sorority in college and you know studying international relations, and so it was a great in Boston, which was a great college town. Navy ROTC was it was just kind of a good a good balance to everything else I did in college. But I graduated in '93 which was the year that women could fly in combat for the first time. So that was very exciting. I had a ROTC commanding officer who was a Tomcat pilot, uh, who was obviously kind of biased towards aviation. And I thought of different things to do. I, I thought about intelligence and cryptology. And, and he said, well, you know, women can fly in combat now. You should really think about aviation. And uh, so I said, well, that, that sounds like an awesome challenge and, uh, and kind of being the tip of the spear. And uh, you're right. I'm going to, I'll put aviation first. So, you know, we have our dream sheet and, and we list. And so I did, I put, I put aviation first. And so after I went and taught English in Japan and came back, started flight school and it took about three and a half years for me to get winged. Uh, as a Navy pilot, and uh, and then uh, Na- Navy flight school is hard. I didn't have any flight time before I went to. I had an hour. My parents bought me an hour in a Cessna that flew over Orlando and, and Disney and everywhere. So that was the only time I had been in a in a small airplane before I showed up uh, at Navy flight. Now my husband, who flew F-18s, he had his private pilot's license and. And uh, had many years of flying experience. So for me, showing up, it was a it was a crash course in, in how to fly. And and I was very happy and content to choose helicopters. I really liked that uh, that mission that we did, which was which was a lot of serving the fleet, uh, flying passengers, mail, cargo. I love special forces, so special ops guys special like me. Forces, guys flew right, me all over the place. <laughs> People that jumped out of my good <laughs> helicopter for no reason. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so I love that mission. So it was, um, it was an easy choice to go, uh, to choose helicopters and I loved 10 of the best years of my life. Yeah. So cool. I'll tell you what I miss most about, uh, the Navy is, is, you know, you, you get on a mission, you, you link up with your helicopter pilot crew. We, we pre-brief, I'm sure you've done Hearst, CAS, SPY, uh, military free fall, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and just, you know, you, you, you link up, everybody is a professional, you know, we're talking about life and death. And but but at the same time, it's just being around people who are good at what they do is so fun. And it's, yes. it just makes you really want to do your job really well. You know, you yeah. don't want to be the yeah. weak, the weak link. Yeah, so. it, everybody was very professional and you're there to do the same mission and you're on the same team. And we, we don't talk about politics. We don't talk about religion. We didn't talk about what's going on in our home. You know, everybody was compartmentalized. Everyone was very focused. Exactly. We were there to do, to do a mission. Everyone was professional. We were all there in our uniforms. We were, safety was always paramount. So, you know, that's what we were focused on. What do we need to do to get the job done? Yeah. Uh, so it was, it was wonderful to work with people like that, you know, day in and day out. And uh, exactly. And, yeah, and exactly. Right. Any of those missions you mentioned. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just let all our dear listeners know before we hit record and started, Jen commented on the uh, photograph behind me, which is the, my leader's logbook for the elevate your leadership offering that I have. But she's like, who's that jumping out of a perfectly good helicopter? And, and I, I won't ask you to repeat what I said, cause it probably hurts for you to say something like that. But, but what I said is there's no such thing as a perfect a good helicopter so that's debatable <laughs> yeah, yeah. or airplane for that matter so, yes, yes. <laughs> so. okay so we talked about where you're from we talked about why you joined the navy and what you did in the navy and so awesome so so cool what a great life up until that point and then the 10 year mark you're like okay time to go time to go be a nurse practitioner now how did that change in profession come about yeah, well, I deployed a couple of times to the Persian Gulf and we did some great just humanitarian missions around the world with the Kosovo conflict and, and being in the Adriatic as well. So I got to see and being in the Persian Gulf uh, when they kicked weapons inspectors out of Iraq. So I'd gotten to see uh, many parts of, of the world and really appreciated, you know, what our military was doing. But uh, but my husband, so my husband and I were deploying back to back. He was, uh, we had met in flight school and we had gotten married uh, when we started our sea tours. So we were, we would deploy, I'd come home, he'd leave, he'd come home, I'd leave. And we did this for about three years. And then on our short tours, I was stationed at Enios Oceana 
doing search and rescue and he was in one of the squadrons there, the BFA 106, one of the training squadrons. So towards the end of our shore tour, we started to have children and uh, I decided we would go back to sea duty then at the same time. And we could have probably, you know, alternated a little bit, but I decided to resign my commission at that point. My uh, service obligation was up. It had been about 10 years. And and so he was going to stay. We were going to go back to Japan. That's when we went and he would be for deployed. Uh, so it just it didn't really make sense for both of us to stay active. We, we could have. My mother was was not as excited to, to help with like, raising the challenge, kids. Still a challenge, though. Yeah. yeah. I, started, I had a second child. And anyway, we have four children. So we made kind of a hard decision. But uh, but I decided to get out to be a stay-at-home mom, for which I did for about five or six years. Uh, and support him, uh, which being a military spouse is a very, very, very important and very hard job. Having done both sides, sometimes I think being the spouse that stays home is is the harder job. I think yeah, sometimes. for sure, <laughs> for so, sure. Uh, so I did that, uh, and and then since I was home and raising the kids, and that's as any stay at home parent will tell you. I mean, that is definitely a job with many challenges. Uh, oh, for so sure. I I did that uh, and was lucky to be able to to stay at home with my children for five or six years, but then I had a GI bill, you know, that I say was burning a hole in my pocket and I, I love being a student. And, uh, and we came home from Japan after our tour and I have a mother who's a nurse and a brother who is also a nurse. And most importantly, I had grandparents who, who really made a uh, impact on my life. I had one set of parent grandparents who lived in New York city that traveled the world that was very independent. And I had another set of grandparents who uh, my grandfather lived in a nursing home that was not a great nursing home, didn't smell good. He was always tied to a chair. He had Alzheimer's disease. It was it was not a good uh, when we visited him. It was always very sad. So they made kind of big impacts on my life and different ways of aging. And uh, and I knew that I wanted to to try to help that patient population. Those older adults, our greatest generation. There's a lot of respect for not only those people who would serve, but just uh, just older adults are kind of a, a voiceless group, a group that doesn't have a lot of advocates. It was uh, awesome to go to nursing school on my GI Bill, and I and we came back to Virginia Beach to be stationed again. And I was able to go to ODU, and uh, when my my children were started school. So I, I went back to school myself, loved ODU. It was a great nursing program and then went right to Vanderbilt to study to become an adult geriatric primary care nurse practitioner and then was able to, to continue uh, in long-term care, assisted living facilities, did, did some time at EVMS at their Center for Geriatrics, uh, have done home health and hospice, and most recently uh, worked in a smaller primary care clinic. So keeping our older adults independent for as long as possible. Uh, so they can enjoy their their golden years. But I just really love that patient population. It's been a great a great place to to learn from them. They're some of the wisest, just smartest, uh, you know, just most grateful people I've ever worked with. Uh, and so I love being an advocate for them in politics as well. But but I, I love my geriatric <laughs> nurse practitioner job. I, I miss it. I'm not able to work as much these days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's so so cool though? Uh, I, I just want to comment on a couple of things there. <clears throat> my wife, Julie, and I have twins. They're 17 years old. And when they were born, uh, my wife stopped working as well. And, you know, mm-hmm. if, if you have the means and the capability to be a stay at mom, a stay at home mom until the kids start school, I just think that's the best way to do it really. And you're right. It is, just, you know, one child is one child, one diaper, one, one runny nose, one sickness. But when you have more than one, it's exponential. Right. It's not like, okay, two diapers and two running because somebody always has something. Right. Right. Yes. And and so that would that actually was motivated me to go to nursing school as well, because I would go to the doctor so much with these four kids. I'm like, but I knew what was wrong with them, what medication they needed what their diagnosis was. So I'm like, you know, I'm just going to go to school myself. And, and so I can, can take care of these kids on my, I think next time I try to probably try to find a pediatrician that I, that I liked a lot because it was a lot of work. I'll say, you know, it was a lot of yeah. work to go through those years of nursing school, but, but it was well worth it. And, uh, and then I got to do, you know, a, a yeah. second career That's that cool. I love. So. Yeah. You know, the other thing I'll comment on real quick is being a veteran of special operations, you know, TBI and PTSD are things that I've been heavily screened for. And luckily um, the mildest form of TBI is anything is all that was ever really detectable, but I still went through some really advanced programming to treat things like that, you know, and then you get into clinical depression and health and wellness. And really that's what it's all about at the end of the day. But a lot of things that are prescribed for geriatric patients um, are things that are just general, generally good things to do for good health exercise 
and um, challenge challenge your brain, challenge your thinking, and of course, uh, you know what you eat. But I, I just I, I, this linkage, I just thought was incredible. And you know, everyone is headed towards dementia, you know, in some capacity, and and we can slow the onset. So uh, right, yes, brain game. We always talk about brain games and brain exercise. But yes, of of all the things you can do, but certainly physical exercise uh, and keeping your cardiovascular risk low. But then brain games and. And diet, Mediterranean diet has, has got a, a lot of attention these days. Uh, you are what you eat. So yeah, yes, exactly. yes, I would love to. We were talking about the other day about just, you know, bringing back some focus on uh, on good physical health and, you know, label reading and, you know, watching what you eat, but then also just that exercise component. It's so good for mental health too. I mean, oh, I, yeah, yeah. The, I'm the, a big runner. I run, that's my mental health, you know, of choice. Oh, yeah. My mental health yeah. Choice, Cause I just think that's the, that, that adrenaline, adrenaline release is is really important. So yeah, so we'll put in a plug for good physical health and yeah. exercise. Oh no, we... huge. And, and just uh, when I do the Elevate Your Leadership offering, mm -hmm. I, I literally talk about how when we elevate our heart rate to between 60 and 85% of your age recommended maximum, neuroplasticity triggers like a light switch, right? The brain's ability yeah. to grow, yes. change, adapt, yeah. and heal. And this yeah. is one of the things when I went through these veterans programs, you know, kind of connected the dots throughout my entire professional life, when you face a challenge, it's like, how, what am I going to do about this? I would go for a run or I would yeah. get a good workout in. Right. And often either during the exercise or immediately after you have the aha moment yeah. and well, yes. no, there's yeah. science behind that, yeah. you know, that's yeah. real. Yeah. So yeah, so there's not a problem I can't solve with, uh, you know, without a good run, you know? Yeah, just, that's I super mean, cool. So the Japanese yeah. uh, speaking friend of mine is also a big runner. So you guys could like run and awesome. speak Japanese that's on your cool. run. That'd be super cool. And, and, you know, you don't have to run. You just, it's just to put it out there. You can also go on a nice long walk, you know? Oh, for sure. Uh, well, that's where I'm at now. Like, yeah. yeah, I had, uh, I had my back operated on and so I, I, I can't run, but I, you know, and I do the bicycle, the Peloton and Perfect. I do yoga every day. I wish I would have started doing yoga 25 years yeah. ago. I started three yeah. years ago because then you get all the breathing techniques. Yes. And, so. I used to love hot yoga was my, was a good, I don't have to, I need to get back to that. It's my go-to. Yeah. That almost was, every day. Everything. Yeah. Oh, good. Good. Yeah. All those things. It's incredible. Okay. We're going to the Disney Academy and then going through some super cool schooling, going to the Naval Flight Academy you know, as if that wasn't enough. And then nurse practitioner, you decided I'm going to run for state Senate. Why did you run? What was, what was your thinking at that time? Well, that was 2019. So about three years ago, I guess. And that was just, uh, was the story goes and the story is real of just me yelling at my television all the time, you know, watching the news. I'm sure many of us do that. I know my parents did it when I was younger, but they always were commenting throughout the, the news. We watch the nightly news every night, but I, I, I generally do that and watch the news still. And and a lot of comment, a lot of yelling at the television, a lot of frustration just with, with politics and really on both sides of the aisle. I thought there was a lot of division, a lot of negativity, a lot of hateful rhetoric. I, I really didn't agree with what I saw. I thought, you know, you guys are not understanding what's important to this country. Your priorities are off. You've got to have people who can do better. There's got to be better than this. Uh, it was also the year that we saw a lot of uh, 2018 was the year that a lot of Democratic women were running and getting elected. Uh, the Republican women, I'm a Republican, the Republicans weren't doing as good of a job at uh, at recruiting, you know, women, minorities. So so I thought there was some, some room for improvement uh, for uh, my conservative team, uh, and then also just some room for improvement overall. I thought that uh, we needed people who who understood just what was at stake and how awesome our country was, but how fragile that was as well. So 2019, I uh, I considered running and I went through a course that the University of Virginia offers. It's the Sorensen Institute, and it was a, a weekend program about how to run a campaign. I just thought I would educate myself. And you know, right before then, Frank Wagner, who was the state senator in my district, he announced his retirement with really not a lot of time before the deadline to get on the ballot. So I went to the Sorensen weekend and I uh, really learned how to run a campaign. And I said, well, you know what? I considered running for Congress because I saw Elaine Lorio, you know, won in, in, in 2018 and uh, the Senate seat opened up and uh, state government is, is we're part-time legislators. So we can still do things like have our a day job and have a career, you know, in another field. And, and my kids were in high school, so they were getting older, but, uh, but still probably needed me a little bit. So so I decided to run for that seat, and then we had about two weeks to get on the ballot, and you have to get, I think it was 250 signatures, you know, so so we 
literally ran around in about a, a week or two's time and uh, and got her name on the ballot. And then kind of the rest is history. Just worked very hard on the ground and you know was able to uh, to win a a uh, contested primary in 2019, and then uh, and then a really tough fight for the seventh district Senate seat, which is Virginia Beach and and part of Norfolk, and uh, and win and and have been in the state Senate since 2020. So, so uh, and then you've been through three legislative sessions, is that correct? That's right, 2020, 2021, <laughs> and 2022. So, in consideration of everything we've talked about so far, now you're sitting in the in the state legislature. From a leadership perspective, does anything jump out? You know, how did you approach it? What have you learned? What what can you tell us about leadership based on, yeah. you know, everything up until that point? Yeah, well, I think an important component of me for leadership for, of leadership is listening. And uh, and I I think I'm a product of both of my parents and uh, my dad, who was who you know, retired as a colonel in the army army. And then my mom, who's a nurse. So, but my mom is definitely has a more, uh, more outgoing, shall we say, personality. She's very, she'll, she'll definitely tell you her opinion. Whereas my dad always kind of came into a situation and, and did a lot of listening, and then would then would make a a, uh, a kind of a monumental statement or uh, you know when he <laughs> spoke we listened. So yeah, and so I think I'm kind of a good mixture of them. I, I think there's a time and a place to to use your your voice, but I think when you're, especially when you're new, and I think any good leader knows, you know, you don't show up and you want to change everything overnight, right? You come in and you, you observe and you, you listen to, to the people that have been there and, uh, and you, you find some ways to make some small changes in the right direction, you know, while you're getting to know people, while you're establishing some relationships, while you're building some trust and some loyalty. So, so that's what I did uh, going into the state Senate. I had never held office before. I had never been a politician before. I showed up with an amazing group of, uh, there's 40 state senators in Virginia. And uh, what an amazing group of people. Uh, what a diverse group of people. People that were lawyers, people that are businessmen, people that are doctors, real estate agents. I mean, just from all walks of life and fascinating people. So smart, you know, such such great people. So, so I did a lot of listening, but a lot of, you know, making friends, uh, a lot of just developing those relationships, but finding my place, you know, I, I was elected center for a reason too. And so using my, my background as a veteran, my background as a mother uh, who had kids in school, who, uh, who was a military spouse. So I was worried about things like community safety. Uh, I was alone a lot, you know, when I was left, uh, my husband deployed and And then I was a nurse practitioner, so I understood healthcare and I understood mental health challenges and I understood older adults, especially healthcare challenges. So when it was my place to speak, you know, those are my areas of expertise. And that's when I especially used my voice. But the first year, it was definitely a lot of listening. And then as I have been there, you know, this past year, uh, I was able to, uh, you learn, you learn a lot as you go and taking a lot of advice. Uh, So you're able to impact, I thought, more change, the more experience I've had being a legislator, understanding the legislative process, which is a which is a whole nother world when you just the committee process, you know, developing bills and legislation and working with lobbyists and, and working with your constituents and people you represent and uh, what's important to them because you're sent to do a very important job and that's to vote for your district. And you know, there's a lot of different voices out there. So you want to be the best representative. And I represent a district that's very, very purple. It's it's not red. It's not blue. It's mm-hmm. not really conservative or liberal. It's uh, you know I only won my election by fifty point eight six percent of the vote. So so just a smidge over you know for uh for the conservative Republican side. So so I recognize that uh, and I know that there are areas where I need to to listen and maybe give a little bit. So I've tried to do that and just uh, understanding the process was helpful. Uh, knowing where you know, my, where my strengths as a legislator are, uh, as a representative, and then just continuing to build on those relationships and across the aisle as well. Some of the legislation that I've had, had passed, you know, in the Senate, we have 19 Republicans, and we have 21 Democrats. So if I want to have a bill passed, then I need some Democrats to vote for my bill. So how can I work across sure. the aisle uh, and have and healthcare, I'm lucky because healthcare is kind of a nonpartisan issue. But right. but some some issues that are more a little more partisan, I care about like election integrity. That's that's an issue that's important to me. I need I need people to have confidence and when they're voting. And and so I had to build this past session about clearing the voting rolls of deceased people with more frequency. So I needed some Democrats to understand what I was trying to accomplish uh, to vote for my legislation, which which we did. And we had you know 30, 32 people in the Senate voted and then eight voted against, but 32 people out of 40 voted for that particular bill. So that That's was a great, great victory. But again, working yeah. on those those relationships and always with the 
premise or with the you know mindset of why I ran for this office in the first place. And it was because I hated negativity. I hated the div divisive rhetoric. I don't think it's essential for what we're doing. So when I am presenting a bill, when I'm talking to someone that doesn't necessarily agree with me, I don't want to offend them. I want to make sure that they are heard. I want them to feel listened to. I think that's a really important piece of being an effective leader. Absolutely. Is that you are, you, you are making them feel like they are heard. I know that I've been in situations in the minority in the Senate where I didn't feel heard, where it didn't, none of us felt heard. And I thought that was wrong because I was sent there. You know, we, we all are representing different viewpoints, but I think that we need to, that all of us need to be listened to and there needs to be room for compromise. And when we can't do that, then, then that result we get is what I hated on television. It's this, this, we're yeah, it. my way or the highway. My right. way or the highway is not the right answer. Right, exactly. So, so I, I really try to practice what I preach when I uh, went and remember why I got into politics, what I hated about what I saw about politics. And I think as veterans, it's, it's easier for us to do. I think we really are focused on what is best for the country, what is best for Virginia, what is best for the people that we represent. It's it's easy for me to do as, as a just focused on that mission. And I think other veterans probably find it a little easier too. We don't partisanship and this, especially this hateful words and things that we use. I, I don't think that's necessary. And it really is distracting. So. Was anybody uh, on the other side of the aisle in the Virginia le legislature, uh, did they have prior military service? There's a gentleman that's in the Air Force who's in the state Senate, Dick Slazla, who's one of our majority leaders. He he's had he was in the I think the Army for a few years. There's a few of them. Yeah, okay, but okay. And we have a veterans caucus, so we get together oh, as, good, a, as good. a bipartisan group good. of veterans. Yeah. Uh, and the House of Delegates has several as well. So Okay, so, good. Uh, good. So yes. And, and the reason I ask is certainly it's for me, it's easier to have discussions. It's easier to have discussions with veterans. And these discussions could be, they could have what, what I call dynamic tension, right? You could disagree on something, but you're not disagreeable with each other. Right. And, right. and that's kind of what we had to do in the military. You know, we had core values in the Navy, honor, courage, and commitment. And that doesn't exclude anybody. You talked about a voice and making sure everybody's heard. And, and, and that's what has to happen. My company now, I have 40 people. And the newest member on the team has just as much of an opportunity to be heard as me or anybody else. We, right. we want to hear from right. everybody. It's, it's critical. Those are your tactical right. kind of frontline people. So I, I think I agree. you're- and, and being a nurse, you know, that was my job when I was a nurse practitioner was to listen to people. And I would have 15 to 30 minutes uh, where I had patients come into a you know closed room and, uh, and they had to tell me about their health problems, which is a lot of personal information sometimes. And, and, but I had to develop that trust in a short amount of time. Uh, and then I had to listen. And then we had to come up with a solution together to what we we're going to do to fix your health problem. But, but I think that was really um, a very good place for 10 years. I was able to hone that listening skill and you know, process that information and to work on a solution. So I still use those same, you know, listening skills. Yeah. And that process. Yeah. And that, processing. That, that sounds like a very effective process. All right. We're going to take a quick pause for capitalism. Jen and I are both good capitalists. When we come back, we're going to talk about why Jen is running for the second U.S. congressional district back in a minute. And we are back talking to Jen Kiggins. We talked about the Disney, Disney, Disney World or Disneyland? Disneyland, it's right? Disney World in Orlando. <laughs> we talked about the Disneyland employee. We talked about the Navy helicopter pilot. We talked about the nurse practitioner. We talked about the state senator. Now, I would like to ask you why it is you are running for the uh, second district in uh, the state of Virginia. Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. So, so what I sat through in Virginia for my, my three years, and especially my first two years in 2020 and 2021, we had one party that ran the General Assembly, so that we had a Democrat-controlled Senate and House, and we had a Democratic governor. So when we, when you're in that type of position where there's one party rule, we call it, and one party has a majority, we see that party really go to their corner. Uh, and, and in my opinion, as a conservative Republican, there was a lot of legislation passed and uh, that, that I certainly didn't agree with, that I didn't think it was in the best interest of Virginia, 
uh, and the people I represented. But again, I talked about, you know, not having that voice. And I just think it's a dangerous way to govern when you discount the whole hat. And Virginia in general is pretty purpley, right? We've seen it flip, flip this past November, went from Democratic rule to we got a Republican governor, Lieutenant governor, attorney general and house. So we're sit, we see a lot of flip flop, you know, in Virginia, but uh, to completely discount uh, one half of the people's opinions. It was a dangerous way to govern. It made the Democratic Party really run to an extreme agenda, a really radical agenda that I didn't agree with. So it was hard to sit through. It's been better this past session where we've had some balance and much appreciated. So I see that same same thing happening on the federal level, right? We've got a Democrat in the White House. We've got a uh, Democrat controlled House of Representatives, and we have a Democrat Senate, it's 50-50 with the Vice President, similar to Virginia, but where the Vice President breaks the tie. So, so you've got one party rule, and when we have one party rule, I mean, I look at the reasons I run right now and, the, and what you know, issues that Americans are caring about and the Virginians are caring about, you know, the economy. We look at the, just talking about the economy and, and gas prices and grocery prices and, and uh, workforce challenges and, and grocery shortages and and so many people are struggling just financially. People are having to choose between, uh, you know, with paying bills and going on vacation. I've had so many stories about and people are carpooling and and I, uh, we're faced with a lot of decisions and even saving for retirement. You know, we can't save as much for retirement, so we're having to work longer. So people are having to get more jobs. Uh, these are the issues that every single American, I don't care if you're Democrat, Republican, or Independent, you know, are caring about. That is and in my opinion, that's the result of a lot of failed policies. You know, love them or hate, I'm the last guy in the White House. You know, we had an economy that was, despite thriving, a pandemic, thriving. that was thriving. <laughs> Gas prices were low. People had jobs. Uh, you know, we had a great standing on the world stage. We had a border that wasn't in crisis. So, again, in my my opinion, and I'm a Republican, I see a lot of room for improvement. We switched it up in the White House, and we get it economy that that's now a disaster. We've got a crisis at the border where we're letting all kinds of people into our country, which is filtering into even into states like Virginia, where we're seeing increased rates in crime and human trafficking and drug trafficking. And then we see some of the, the issues on the world stage, which is a veteran and as a, a wife to a veteran. And now I've got kids in the military. My son is at the Naval Academy. I have a son. Congratulations. In that's awesome. Thank you. But, you know, I think of my kids and now my kids are going to inherit some of these problems that we're not the deterrent that we used to be in the military. And if there's one thing that really frustrates us as veterans, it's we, we understand the importance of world peace and stability. We know that our military is great, but we gotta, we gotta work to keep it there. This is an all volunteer force. What can we do to support these guys, not just through pay, but making sure they've got the ships they need, the weapons they need, the support and resources that they need. So I just feel like the current administration is, does, does not have our backs as, as a, uh, as for the active duty and veterans. Uh, we need to get some better leadership in place so that our friends are trusting us out there on the world stage and our enemies are fearing us again. Because I worry that this is, this is where we're at. We watched what happened in Afghanistan last year. That was not great. Uh, we killed 13 servicemen and women. Terrible. It was a mess. You know, I, I had veteran friends who were, who have nothing to do with politics that were, they knew I'm something in politics. They kept texting, you know, what's, what's going on in the country? What's going on? What is going on with the military? This is not the military. We know this is not what our country should be doing. So, so for me, it's, it's very personal on my, just again, relationship with the military and having a huge military family. There's so much room for improvement. And I, for me, these things are caused by a direct result of this one party rule. Cause I've sat through it in Virginia. I had a front row seat to it. I know the danger that, and what that does to a Commonwealth. And I see the same thing happening to our country. So I am not going to sit back, sit back and, and let that happen if I can do something about it. So I, I've learned a lot being, you know, running and, and winning the state Senate seat. I understand politics. It's a whole nother world out there, but I think we need to have some good people who are kind of common sense leaders who, who understand what's at stake who understand where our country's priorities need to be and who understand and, and can get things done effectively without being offensive, without being negative. I think our country doesn't need that. We don't need that negativity anymore. We can get things back on the right track. I think of when, you know, when I was growing up, Ronald Reagan was president and I, I, I'm a big fan. I'm a, I'm a big one. Oh, yeah, but, you absolutely. know, we, we were all on the same page. We love the country. We flew our flag. We were uh, you know, we all stood for the national anthem. So uh, Ronald Reagan had this on his desk in the Oval Office. <clears throat> and I quote. actually I actually got this from. So for the listeners out there, I'm I'm showing a little placard I have that says it can be done. The word can in all caps. But Ronald Reagan had that on his desk in the Oval Office. 
And I bought this placard at the Reagan Presidential Library in Simi Valley, nice. California. Nice. I like that very much. <laughs> Big Reagan so we fan. Need, we need to put leaders in place who can who can get us back on on the right track, really. And 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 that for me starts with flipping the U.S. House of Representatives, and we need six seats to flip this year in order to flip the majority back to a conservative. Republican majority and this path through uh, through flipping the House, uh, in my opinion, goes through the second congressional district in Virginia, uh, which with redistricting, it, which I think you mentioned, you know, it's all of Virginia Beach, all the Eastern Shore. We've got most of Chesapeake, except all Franklin, Southampton, Isla White. So with the new lines, it's much more of a conservative Republican district, yep. uh, which favors my party and favors me. So now we don't sit back and go on vacation. We still work very, very hard uh, from now to November to educate voters, you know, about who their current represent, you know, representative is and and how she votes, uh, and and uh, what I stand for, and uh, and my voting record in the state Senate, who I am as a conservative. Uh, and what direction I think the country should be going in. So, uh, and then we need everybody to come out and vote in November. You know, that's an important component of this is uh, is people using your your voice, which is through voting. So, you know, registering to vote uh, and actually getting to the polls on November 8th, just, uh, you know, that that's what our campaign will be about, uh, education. So, uh, you know, our, our current representative votes with Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, 98% of the time. So if you were in agreement with that team and the direction that they're taking our country, then you can vote that way. But I'm offering this alternative, yeah. which is uh, which is a whole different direction. We need to get back to some basic principles, restoring strength in our economy, restoring strength in our border, and especially restoring strength in our foreign policy. So I hope that your listeners are, you know, registered to vote and, and we'll get out there and uh, and make the right choice in November. Yeah, well, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, that's going to happen. And it, I'm very confident. I'm looking forward to that date and, uh, you know, the date that you do take the oath. And that is the Thank day you. that uh, all these things you mentioned that are wrong, that are going in the wrong direction, hopefully will get reversed. I mean, the border, the border in and of itself is such a crisis. It is, it's an invasion. It's a crisis. And the fact that it's ignored and not even talked about. And, you know, that's one of the other things. So with your, your competitor, Elaine Loria, I have never heard her or read in her, um, you know, in her messaging, anything about the border or anything about um, national security as it relates to international relations. Saudi Arabia is the current kind of thing that you see on the news every day, but, but there's Ukraine and there's Russia. And I just, I'm not, I realize that you represent the district, but as a collective body, you represent the national security and the uh, financial wellness of the United States. Um, Jen, have I left anything out? Is there anything that I should have asked you that I didn't or anything you want to add? Oh, gosh. I mean, you asked me a lot of questions. I think we went through that <laughs> bio and why I'm running and just just really what's at stake. I mean, I, I always tell people who aren't real familiar with politics, and, and I wasn't either, really, but I was very busy, you know, being a helicopter pilot, being a mom, being a uh, going to school and, and being a nurse and, you know, but just getting so frustrated that I, I was so frustrated and cared so much that I got off my couch and decided to run for office. But but I, I try to impress upon people who, who really don't uh, aren't very politically engaged uh, that the fight is very real out there. You know, I ran for office just because I was frustrated and I didn't like the rhetoric. But uh, but being in the room and being a part of the decision making and having the honor of pushing a voting button, uh, which is a which is a great honor and one that I absolutely do not take lightly. But the fight is very real out there. And I, I need your your listeners to, to know that, you know, in the fight for what's going on in Washington, D.C., it, it is truly a fight. I don't like the way that, you know, the direction that our country is headed. I, I I miss things like the 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 days when I grew up. I grew up in the 80s, you know, in the 70s and 80s when uh, we had the bicentennial, bicentennial and, and, you know, people flew the flag and, and we were reverent and respectful for our country and we appreciated those who served and we stood for the national anthem. You know, those you know, we've got to get back to that. We've got to get some of these mm -hmm. basics, just like in education, you know, get back to the basics in education. Uh, but uh, but back to the things that our country is is awesome. And those of us who have served and who have traveled the world, we know how awesome it is. We literally want to kiss the ground when we get back, get back here after a six month deployment. Absolutely. So people need to appreciate that. And, you know, America is good. And yes, we've had some trials and tribulations, which, which we work through, but but uh, but we've got to prioritize what's at stake here. And, you know, if you don't have world peace and world stability uh, and I'm a big peace through strength girl, 
And, and if we can't get back to, you know, you know, making that the pri priority, the priority is what's best for, for our nation and, and, uh, and just staying focused together as a team uh, and stop trying to find what divides us and let's work on what unites us because together we are great, but divided, you know, it's, I, I worry about, about what's going to happen with the country. So the fight is very real for me, but getting people and it's a team effort. It's not something I do by myself. It's not something that, you know, the, the speaker of the house or, you know, whoever else does, you know, the president does my, it is a team effort out there. So I need the right people on my team uh, to work hard, but, and even those of you who are not, you know, the push, person up there in the chamber pushing the button, you know, I need, I need everyone on my team too, because your, your contribution, if you put up a yard sign, if you tell your friends to go vote, if you, you know, go on social media and, and like, you know, what you're, but be engaged in politics. It is a fight. You need to be involved. You need to use your voice. Let me know, you know, what's important to you. Uh, and then just care. I need people to, you know, to, to care and to be involved. So, and get out and vote in November. But, uh, but just, you know, thank you for giving me time to, to talk about me and talk about my platform and, and uh, where I come from and what's important to me. So I really appreciate just being here. That's great. That's awesome. So united we stand, divided we fall. Get out there and vote Jen Kagan's final message, regardless of your political affiliation, get out there and vote. Jen, wonderful discussion. Thank you so much for coming on the Elevate Your Leadership podcast. You're welcome. Thanks for having me, Bob. Thank you for listening to the Elevate Your Leadership podcast. To contact Bob directly or to learn more about how Bob can advance you and your organization through leadership training, team building, executive coaching, and public speaking, visit robertpizzini.com. Robert P-I-Z-Z-I-N-I dot com and connect with him on LinkedIn.